projecting enough or do I need to talk a little louder? Louder? Okay, thank you. My name is Christy Honecker and I am a wellness education specialist with Gunderson Health System and specifically the All of Us Research Program, which is what I'm here to talk with you about today. So I'm really excited to be here. It's been a long time since I've done an in-person presentation. Um, a lot of my presentations most recently have been uh, virtual because of COVID and how our society has been functioning recently. So I'm um, glad to be here and thank you Heather for, for having me and, and glad to see all your faces. This is such a great turnout and I am looking forward to talking with you and if if you have any questions at all during my presentation about um, anything that I've said or just questions in general, please feel free to raise your hand and we can have a conversation about the program. So has anyone heard of the All of Us Research Program? Have you seen anything on TV? Have you heard any radio? Yes. I hear, see a couple hands. Has anybody actually joined the All of Us Research Program? Okay, good. I'm talking to the right audience. Excellent. So All of Us is a national effort to build a research database. We are trying to advance the science of precision medicine. This started in 2018 and here locally in 2019, actually at the end of 2019. Um, and so Gunderson actually started enrolling individuals at the beginning of 2020, which was literally right when COVID hit our community. And so we were able to enroll people um, to come on site um, for about two months, and then we had to pause and kind of have a uh, reevaluation of how we were going to actually enroll people. And so, so we had to go virtual. We did a lot of um, health interviews with Gunderson providers online just so we can provide people information. Uh, so the All of Us program is geared towards precision medicine. Right now, our healthcare system is more of a one size fits all, a sort of a guess and check system. So if you go in for um, some ailment, they're going to give you a certain medication. And maybe that medication works with you in your body and maybe it doesn't. And so you have to go back to the doctor and say, this is not working for me, what else can we try? And so the idea behind this is precision medicine. We wanna be able to look at an individual based on their holistic, everything about them, their lifestyle, their genetics, their biology, how their body is actually made up in their environment. Because we know that all of these factors play a significant role in who you are as an individual. And in the past, like I had said, it's more of a one size fits all method of care. And so precision medicine can look at an individual, look at their genomics, look at their uh, blood type, look at their lifestyle, their environment, and say, we know that this treatment or this prevention technique will work for you because we have all this information about you. And so all of us is really trying to build a research database by collecting health information from individuals. So we have a little video that we are going to share that just gives you an idea of what all of us is about, and it kind of gives um, a broader picture. So we're going to try to play the video here through the microphone. Yeah. like I had mentioned before, inside of your body makes up who you are and essentially how you should be cared for um, before you get sick, when you're sick, and after in order for people to live long and healthy lives. So our mission is to accelerate health research 
by enabling individualized care for all. And so the idea is for us to enroll 1 million individuals across the nation. These are individuals who are 18 years of age or older. And I should just back up for one moment. Uh, I will say that our goal here in the state of Wisconsin is to enroll 100,000 people. Right now, we are working with Marshfield Clinic. We are working with the Medical College of Wisconsin. We are working with the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and Milwaukee. And right now, we have about uh, a little over 17,000 participants just in the state of Wisconsin. The program at a national level has about 479,000 people already enrolled in this program. And so we're on our way there. Uh, we did hit a little snafu with COVID because we just had to kind of re-envision as, as a nation what this program could look like and how we could still reach people without actually being able to communicate face to face with them. And so that's a huge part of this, is being able to build relationships with individuals. We want to be able to nurture that relationship um, for 10 or more years, because this is a longitudinal study. We're gonna be moving with people as they grow and age, as they get sick and try treatments. And so part of what we ask people to do is provide information um, through their electronic health record, through health surveys, all of this information is de-identified. And so that is the information that we're using to build this research database. So really the program is twofold. We're collecting information from individuals, and then we're also providing that information to researchers who are able to utilize this information. Like I said, that's been de-identified. We, we don't share with insurance companies. That's another thing um, that a lot of people are interested in. Do we, do we take this health information from individuals and share it with, it, with um, health insurance companies? And the answer is no. Um, the only way that they would be able to see, uh, that a health insurance company would be able to see information that's provided is if an individual, say I got something back that said I might be at a higher risk for breast cancer. If I take this report that the program gives to me, and I bring it into my doctor's office. So we're trying to build a research ecosystem here. And, and in doing so, we want researchers to be able to present their information and their findings that they have um, generated through this data that we are collecting. So we're working with quite a few guests. Just so you know, on that last slide, the yellow and the green were not readable. Oh my gosh, yeah, no, they are, they are not readable at all. Okay, so this says deliver the largest and richest biomedical resource. Thank you. Um, and then this says to catalyze a robust ecosystem um, of researchers and funders um, who are eager to support the program. Thank you, appreciate that. So we're not in this alone. We are working with a variety of partners in order to be able to, to accomplish this goal. Um, Thunderston is a healthcare provider organization here locally. Um, we're working with the Data and Research Center. That's where all of this information is actually housed. Um, it's clean and curated for researchers to be able to use. It's kept on a secure cloud-based platform where they frequently security test um, to make sure that there can be no um, intrusions from outside hackers. We work with genomic partners. So that's a huge thing about this program that people are really excited about. If individuals participate, they choose to share their electronic health records, then they can actually get information back about their own genome, what it looks like and how it interacts with certain medications. Um, they can get information back about their ancestry and their traits. And they can also get information back about certain diseases and if they may be at a higher risk. So the program is actually going to whole genome sequence one million people's genomes. So we're gonna have this information to build this resource, but also to be able to give information back to individuals to empower them to make positive changes for their own health. Um, we also work with a participant technology system center. Um, so what that means is that we're working with a platform that allows individuals to be able to log into their specific account online to be able to answer their surveys, do their consents online, and also to receive their information back. 
So that is just the, the platform where people would get and, um, and give their information. So we're looking at diversity here. We know that there have been so many groups underrepresented in biomedical research in the past. For example, women, <laughs> people over the age of 65, those living in rural areas, um, African Americans, people with low socioeconomic status, all of these people have not been researched before. And, and we know not only that everybody is different, but groups of people react to things differently, whether that's a treatment or a prevention. And so in order for us to be able to catalyze this robust ecosystem, we need to understand individuals at the individual level. And so that's why this is so innovative, is that we're trying to enroll people who are 18 years of age and older, and we're trying to focus on um, those individuals who've been left out in the past. Um, we know that, that people respond differently, even to Tylenol. Um, to things as simple as, um, you know, um, uh, heart medications or diabetes or, or uh, you know, they live in a rural environment, so maybe they're exposed to things like pesticides or things of that nature, or maybe they don't have access to health care. Um, and so we want to be able to understand diversity at the individual level, and we also want to be able to provide diversity in the data that we are collecting. So that is why we're looking at the environment, we're looking at, um, we're looking at behaviors, lifestyle choices, um, all of those things make up who we are, and then we're trying to follow individuals um, for the course of 10 or more years to be able to see how their health changes over time. Again, like I had mentioned, this is a national resource that's open to all. So what that means is aggregate level data can currently be viewed at researchallofus.org. If you're interested in looking at the survey questions that people have answered, if you're interested in looking at how many people have enrolled, um, they recently did a COVID survey to kind of understand the, um, the impacts, physical and mental, that it's had on people in different communities. You can actually look at the answers. And this is all at an aggregate level data, so they're not specific numbers, um, but you can get an idea of how people have responded to um, this time that we're living in. Um, so it's pretty interesting, yes? Do you have an age limit on who you enroll? You said you might follow for 10 years, and some people might not be. They just, at this point, they just have to be over 18 or over with the uh, decisional capacity to consent. So there's no, there's no upper limit. Because, because you know, here's the thing. Like, if we, if we find, if we're enrolling someone who is 110, how did they get there? <laughs> what are they doing? You know, it, it, what is their, what is their, um, their quality of life like? You know, so that's that's interesting. We want to be able to represent these different groups of people who have not been represented. How did this person get to be 110 years old? Um, you know, what are they doing? Are they eating their vegetables every single day? Are they walking? What, what, is that, what does that look like? And, and how can that be um, contributed to research? So we know that research in the past, um, it's, it's been challenging for people to find funding. It's been challenging for people to, uh, to be able to find individuals that actually relate to the cohort that they want to study. Um, and so just being able to uh, provide this resource, which individuals have to apply, they're vetted. So they have to be um, part of an organization that is in agreement with the NIH. Um, they have to go through a whole system of being able to say that they are going to use this research, um, use their, the information that they have um, ethically, responsibly, and all of the research that researchers are actually conducting on this database is monitored. Um, so it's, it's accessible, but it's not, um, it's not like just anybody can go and do it. It's, it's someone that is actually a partner with an organization, and they have to be um, they have to be vetted before they can access this information, unless they're going to the aggregate level data, which is what I was talking about as far as viewing the surveys. Um, you can see just how many people are in the program and things of that nature. 
Um, so again, it, we're talking about biological and social factors here. We, we want to focus on all of these differences that make up an individual because there's just so many things that, that make people who they are and we need to collect that information in order to be able to understand people um, to move towards precision medicine. We're following participants as they move, grow, and age, and that's going to help give researchers an insight into what keeps people um, healthy and what makes them sick. And again, we're looking at people who have been underrepresented in biomedical research in the past. And so just studies previously have focused just on um, middle-aged Caucasian males, and we know that not everyone is a Caucasian middle-aged male, and so we need to look at how diversity impacts health. So at this point, um, we have surveys from 329,000 plus people, um, including answers related to lifestyle, access to care, their experiences during COVID, their electronic health records from 214,000 plus people. Um, like I said, all of these are de-identified. Um, so a researcher would not be able to pick and choose and say, oh, I want this person or this person. Um, they, they don't have access to personal information that could identify an individual. Physical measurements from 267,000 plus people. So when an individual decides to join the program, they can participate as much or as little as they would like. And so what happens is an individual would go to joinallofus.org if they had interest in signing up. And then they would view videos and consent forms. The first is consent to actually join the program. The second is consent to share their electronic health record. So that's an option, it's not necessary, but if people do want to share their electronic health record, then they will be invited in for a physical measurement um, and a bio sample. So that is a donation of blood and urine. So the blood we would need in order to be able to sequence the whole genome. And the urine, we're looking at environmental factors like pesticides and things of that nature. Um, and so they would come in for an appointment with blood pressure, heart rate, um, physical measurements and bio samples um, and then as a thank you or as a um, reimbursement for time and travel individuals who get to that point um, in enrolling would receive a $25 quick trip gift card um, as a reimbursement for their time and travel and so the surveys are also done online uh, through the participant portal and that could take um, anywhere from 15 minutes to about an hour and a half depending on um, how quick you read, how fast you can click through, um, things of that nature. We're also asking participants if they would like to share their, yes? Uh, about the physical measurements. If you currently have very current um, measurements in your electronic health records, would you have to repeat that? Great question. Actually, that is something that they are working towards, just pulling it from the electronic health record. Um, it's not finalized yet because this is a national program and let's be honest, any national program, it takes a long time for things to happen um, because they have to go through a lot of changes um, to be able to make sure that everything lines up. But yes, that's an excellent question. That's something that they're working towards, just being able to pull um, the physical measurements from the electronic health record as opposed to having to do that on site. Um, at Gunderson, which we are enrolling people in La Crosse on Alaska, and then we also are in Tolma and Winona a couple days out of the week as well. And so an appointment, um, just depending, will take anywhere from about, uh, I would say 30 minutes to about an hour and a half. So we have nearly 100,000 whole genome sequences. That's where they literally look at all of your DNA. Um, and what they're looking for is there are 59 different types of markers um, that are recognized by the American College of Medical Genetics as diseases that could be um, prevented or, or cured if found at an early stage. 
And so what they're doing when they sequence the whole genome is looking for those specific types of things, as well as ancestry, traits. Um, for example, you can receive information back about lactose intolerance, about cilantro preference, whether you think it tastes soapy or whether you are more, um, more prone towards liking cilantro, um, caffeine tolerance as well. So, and, and also one, one weird one is earwax type, whether you have wet or dry earwax. Um, so they'll return some of that information to you. Um, the whole genome sequence and the pharmacogenomics, so how your DNA interacts with certain medications, that is gonna take a little bit of time after people um, do donate their blood um, specimen, just because it's, uh, an entire process. And actually, at, at this point, they just released um, whole genome sequence information to the controlled tier of the researcher database. So those are people who have, like I said, registered and gone through this whole vetting process um, to be able to see and utilize this information for their research studies. So what is the promise for participants? Um, the ability to uh, represent your community, like I said, um, everybody's body is different and, and we want to be able to, to bring that information. If, say for example, someone has a rare disease that doesn't have a cure, and if they could potentially provide their information um, and could potentially help to find a cure for later on down the line. Um, realistically, this is like we're doing the building blocks right now. This is still in its infancy and we want to be able to see how this can change health for generations to come. There's also the opportunity to learn about additional um, opportunities. So for example, there is an ancillary study um, being conducted in the next couple months. It's called Nutrition for Precision Health and it is going to be um, developing um, different ways in which people are flourishing based on their diet, looking at the gut microbiome, um, looking at dietary guidelines, looking at um, physical activity levels, and so they are going to be inviting people from all of us to participate in this Nutrition for Precision um, Health study. There's also uh, the ability to access your own data. Like I said, you're going to get this information back. Um, they send out a newsletter with really interesting um, facts at the national and local level, um, just giving you health information right at your fingertips. We also have a community advisory board here um, that I started for our area um, at Gunderson, which is just local people just getting together to kind of learn more information about the program, kind of help us to find engagement opportunities, um, helping to give us their feedback about certain print and uh, digital materials that we use. You know, does it make sense? Should we use a different picture? Just giving people being able to give their, their opinions and feedback on the program um, so that it comes to me and my team and to make sure that we're meeting the mark and then to also um, elevate that to the national level if necessary. Uh, we also have two um, individuals who sit um, on the national level board for the community as far as our state of Wisconsin goes as well. So these are just a few different questions that the resource um, might be able to answer um, or to potentially develop new treatments, um, new prevention strategies. Um, I know they're a little bit difficult to see um, or may slow or potentially stop different kinds of dementia. So how do we um, utilize this information to, to generate some new research findings? How can we prevent chronic pain that affects more than 100 million people? Uh, there's, it really, it really runs the gamut. It could be anything from immunology to diabetes to um, access to healthcare and, and things of that nature. So really, this is, like I said, it's, it's a resource. We're not focused on one particular study. We are trying to enable these studies to So I want to touch again on privacy and security just because I feel like it's, it's really important for people to know that this information is not shared um, with insurance companies. Like I said, unless 
you're bringing out this report that you received information about your genetic makeup that says you could be at a greater risk for a certain disease. And so then if you bring it to your doctor, that would be the only way that your insurance company would find out. Um, they do rigorous security testing in this cloud-based platform. Um, we say the risk is, is um, very minimal. It's not zero, um, but it's, it's the, the most minimal that we can make it. Uh, we're also protected by certificates of confidentiality, so it's not like um, 23andMe where we would share information with law enforcement if some DNA was found at a crime scene or things of that nature. Um, we would actually be able to fight um, a, uh, we would be able to fight that in a court of law if there was someone that was trying to generate information from an individual's DNA. If you choose that you do not want to get information back about your DNA, you don't have to. Uh, that's your choice. Um, it's, it's completely and totally up to you. And I will also mention that if an individual does have an increased risk for a certain disease, we pair them for free with a genetic counselor to talk about what that means. Uh, to talk about what that increased risk actually means because we know that it's so important and a lot of people might not really understand what that genetic result is. So we want to be able to pair them to have an appointment with the genetic counselor. Um, and then we will also run an additional test for free of the whole genome to ensure that the result that we had found originally was 100% accurate. So these are all safeguards that we have in order to protect the participants um, because we want to make sure that um, we are putting uh, transparency and trust um, into that relationship. And so, so we pair them with genetic counselors and then we also um, make sure that the result that we had found initially is 100% accurate and run it again. So just a brief overview about the workbench itself. Um, participants will share their information. Participant data is received and secured. And then, like I have said, anyone can visit the research hub, which is the aggregate level data, um, to see the surveys and the data browsers. Researchers will have to register and go through a whole vetting process to ensure that they are who they say they are and that they're gonna use this information ethically. And then registered researchers can create projects using workspaces on the platform that we have created, that all of this research program has created. They can't download this information to their own computer. All of this, this research that they are conducting, all of the, um, the statistics that they are running have to be done on our platform so that we can see what's happening. And then research underway, it can be viewed at the research um, database as well. So you can go on and actually see all the projects that are taking place as of now. So with that being said, um, that is all the talk that I have. I did bring a